Coming up, the New York football Giants lose to the Pittsburgh Steelers on the road, and there is so much to talk about from coaching, from execution, and ultimately from the draft. Where does this team stand right now as we think about the future? We dive in. All coming up next. Ah, uh, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your hosts over here, Adam Armitage, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We're healthy, wealthy, and wise. We're in full disagreement about a lot of stuff. We're going to try to keep it clean for the podcast, as the New York Football Giants, obviously, on Monday night, fell on the road to the Pittsburgh Steelers. There's a lot of things to get to, both on and off the field for the New York Giants, Andy. But let's start on the field, and the... <laughs> The positive and negative takeaways coming out of this loss that falls the Giants to two and six. Well, let's start with the positives because we may as well fill people with joy before we crush their souls and their spirits, just like oh, the Giants do for us every week. Positive. Yeah. Tyrone Tracy Jr. looked awesome. I am shocked that the Giants were able to run the ball as effectively as they were able to do it. And the main reason why is because Tyrone Tracy was explosive, he was opportunistic. He made big plays. He made the right decisions in terms of what lanes and what holes and what gaps to be able to, to, to run through. He ran hard. He ran hard after contact. Adam, he had 145 yards on 20 rushes. He had that 45-yard touchdown. He looked explosive. It felt like every time he touched the ball, good things were happening for the Giants. So right out of the gate, I want to give him his flowers because he played exceptional he was the best player on the offense for the Giants against the Steelers. Yeah, runs with a heck of a lot of power, right? Like, he, he's a very smart runner in terms of the backfield. We've heard this over the last few weeks in terms of national commentary when you're watching the games live. They talk about how he reads the, the blocking that's getting set up for him. He makes quick decisions as far as planting a foot, cutting outside, going where the play is designed to go, and then also being willing to work off script as, at times as well. Now, he does suffer a concussion in this game and has to exit. But I will say, if you want a silver lining about him being able to come back and play this next week and just going forward for the Giants, Tyrone Tracy Jr. put out over on X. Would you believe if I said this is only my second year at the position and he has the highlight up of him on the 45-yard touchdown run that he had against the Pittsburgh Steelers? So maybe he's a little more confident that you know it was, it was a difficult moment, had to come out of the game. We know the concussion protocol. Maybe he's a little more bullish that he'll be able to get back out there on the field. But I think you're right. Listen, um, PFF has this. We'll talk about it as we move forward. This draft class has been good for the New York Giants. We saw Theo Johnson had a nice catch in this game as well. Drew Phillips has been coming along. So, you know, in the spectrum of, of what's worked and hasn't worked for this organization, a lot of the young players that they put some confidence and stock into are coming to fruition over the course of this. I do have a, I want you to go ahead again, but I have a, a also an interesting I have a dig at the organization question for you in a moment. Oh, well, listen, I, we destroyed Greg Joseph quite a bit. The special teams is an abject failure, which we're going to talk about later. But hey, credit where credit's due. He hit four field goals in this game because the Giants couldn't really get it into the end zone. He yep. did his job. We destroy him every time he misses field goals and it costs him the game. He played well. So I think it's just noteworthy. Sometimes we need to give kickers love too. He, he had four kicks. I did not feel confident as he stepped up to kick any of them. But he went four for no. four, kept the Giants in the game, and at least you weren't sitting there being like, man, if we only made that field goal, X would have happened. He made all of them, although the Giants fell short. It wasn't uh, because of the leg of Greg Joseph. This is such a hodgepodge game, too. This is the game where the Giants had 11 penalties. Like, this is the part that you get oh. into where you say, you know, bad football teams make bad plays when it matters most. So 11 penalties, 65 yards. Now, 50 penalty yards for the Steelers, but on just five penalties. So you think about momentum of drives, you think about key moments, and you think about false starts and a lot of silly things that well-coached teams shouldn't have happened to them. That's the other big takeaway for me. What a weird, what a weird bucket of of samples on Brian Dable. The the good, as we like to say, is that he intentionally put a 12th man on the field to get a penalty. So only 10 penalties in this game because the one was positive. To in order to stop the clock and allow the Giants to be able to use timeouts and still give themselves a chance at the end of the game. Very heady play. Very smart Genius. stuff. Genius. Now, the part where Theo Johnson is on the wrong side of the line when you're trying to get your last final play off and TJ Watt comes effectively unblocked, taking on 
uh, Illuminor on the right side and gets the strip fumble after you get the big fumble on Russell Wilson. You know, is that Daniel Jones getting people in the right position? Is it Theo Johnson, a rookie? Whatever it may be, well-coached teams don't go out on the field in the wrong position and fail to get lined up. Is it the two-point conversion that we can talk about whether or not it's the right time to go for it? I can defend the logic of it. But to have Daniel Jones snap the football and have every offensive lineman standing on the outside go, huh, me, we block? And have Malik Neighbors. And then, I mean, the world where Daniel Jones is walking out the field going, what the F are we doing? And you're like, yeah, Daniel Jones is right. Like, what bizarro world. I Adam, it's so funny that you say that because that feels like the microcosm. I mean, off the pod, we were talking about Daniel Jones' ball placement, and we're, we're all over the place on the fact that this team stinks anyways. But yeah. that play was just a microcosm of like, what well, it, it it looked silly. The team looked foolish, yeah. and everyone's pointing at like who's who did it wrong. Whose fault was that? Because right. it's like it's either Daniel Jones's fault, it's either the center's fault, or it's six guys in front of Malik Neighbors that didn't know what was going yeah. on. And that is just like a microcosm of this of the season and where we are as at the state of the Giants, where it's like it may have not been Daniel Jones's fault. But he threw the ball, and it looked silly, and right. it was someone's fault because they clearly weren't on the same page. I mean, what like that play going for it on fourth down? I'd agreed with because we know the analytics in recent years have suggested if you're down two scores in the fourth quarter, you go for two early, so that if you get it, you can have a game-winning drive to kick the extra point, and if you don't get right. it, you go for two. the The decision to go for it on fourth down was fine, but. I saw Justin Pennick, Pennick uh, of Talking Giants. He was like, why can't we just run our offense? Why can't we yeah. like just give the ball to Tyrone Tracy? Why can't we throw up a, a, a route to plant route to Robinson or Theo Johnson or literally anyone? Yeah. Why are we doing trick plays to catch people off guard when we're like not we're not good enough to do those. You got to be, that's you got to be competent before you can be exotic, right? Like you got to just be like right, a team like, right. hey, Win or lose, win or lose. We walk out on the field. We all know where we're supposed to be. We all execute down in distance. Everyone, hey, it's all it's all working very smoothly, even if we're not having success on a play to play basis. To, to your yeah, to your point, to be like, and now this is where we start getting tricky with them. You're like, is tricky really? Is that our thing? Are we like a tricky team? Dave, let's run the Statue of Liberty play. Statue. It's like, how about we just run the ball? How about that? Like, you, and especially going back success. to the top where you have Tyrone Tracy Jr. and he's been playing well. And at that point, maybe he's not in the game. You know, we understand you've been having success in a key areas of this football game. Why get crazy with it? Now, also falling into the bag of the high level is the running into the punter. Yes, it happened. And it should have been a penalty, right? And and guess what? This is the part where, and, no, and by the way, no Giants fans are really talking about it like this. No one's putting in the context of, well, if not for that, you know, no non-penalty call, no. It's a. It's not called. They give up the return. That hurts you. You lose twenty eight to twenty six to eighteen, and you gave up a touchdown on a punt. So bad special teams play overall, and you don't get to complain about it. I know because you're not I a know. good football team. You I, don't get I, to make this many mistakes and have these many moments, then turn around and go, well, screwed once again. Like sorry, bad teams make the mistakes when it matters most, and you don't get the benefit of the doubt on a bad call. You hit the nail on the head. It's like yes, that was a rough in the passer. And it hurt even more because it was returned for a touchdown. It wasn't like, oh, they got good field position. They marched on the field and they scored. It was literally the same play that they scored a touchdown. But I was the same way as you. I was like, that's messed up. It shouldn't happen. But guess what? The Giants had the ball multiple times, down one score after that. And they did right. not execute. Daniel Jones threw a baffling interception. Daniel Jones got sacked on, on a fumble where he held the ball too long. Protection wasn't good. The Giants only have themselves to blame. You can look at the Malik neighbors early on in the game. The guy was holding his arm on a deep throw. That could yeah. have been a pass interference. There's a whole host of things that could have went the Giants way that didn't, but it still doesn't change the fact that the Giants aren't a good team and they probably weren't going to, even if those things went right, we're basically sitting at around a tie game anyway. And I still think the Pittsburgh Steelers win, right? And something else goes wrong, right? Like those things right. go right. Well, <laughs> something else will go wrong. And, you know, you mentioned it. It, it. it can only be capped off by Daniel Jones throwing a classic, slightly leaning back, a little bit high, off the tip, intercepted. It's a bad play by him. He's not the only thing that went wrong in this game. He finishes with a QBR under 39. And the contrast in this, by the way, of Russell Wilson Hey, guess what? Why they switch from Justin Fields to Russell Wilson for those two or three key drop the bean in the bucket plays that he had downfield touchdown pickings like all those sequences really mattered here. 
um, for this game. And, and it really is that contrast, man. We talked about this coming into it. Organizationally, stalwart, blue chip, the historic franchises. Well, one of them is still upholding that legacy, and the other one right now looks like the Keystone Cops. I'll let all the fans decide which is which. Uh, I mean, you mentioned it, dropping it in a bucket. For whatever you think of Mr. Unlimited and Russell Wilson, watching him throw the deep ball is still really, really pretty, right? Adam, like, those oh, yeah. passes that he had to George Pickens off to the side, it felt like that's like an Eli Manning off, to this, uh, off the sideline grab with Mario Manningham. That's how accurate Russell Wilson is with the deep ball. The one other thing I will say about this game Mm -hmm. is I, I I don't know how to say this nicely. Um, I'm excited. The left tackle position for the Giants, like even if you think the season is completely done, which I... Yeah, don't. I know. We I, wanted I, to I get don't. through some positive things and some nice stuff, but my I, Lord. I, I, like, w they thought Joshua Zudu like, was their left tackle, and that was the game plan in the offseason was he's going to be the swing tackle. Let's prepare him. He's got a year of seasoning. Let's do that. Like within one game, they completely abandoned that plan. And I'm okay with them abandoning that plan because Joshua Zudu looked overwhelmed. They bring in Mark Hubbard and they say, instead of moving Illuminor over, we're going to have Hubbard start at left tackle. And uh, of there were 67 tackles that played in week mm -hmm. eight of the NFL season. Mark Hubbard finished 67th out of 67 tackles in, in terms of his grade, his pass rush win rates, like his mm -hmm. pass blocking. He was unequivocally the worst tackle that participated in the NFL this past weekend. And that was your contingency plan to the other contingency plan. It just, it's just another microcosm of how it feels like we are not prepared with all the penalties, the illegal shifts. We're not prepared. The front office is not preparing with backup plans for when people inevitably get injured. It was tough to watch. We mentioned yep. Daniel Jones did not play well. The offensive line against a very good Pittsburgh Steelers pass rush looked overwhelmed the entire game. Yeah, I thought the only, you know, the running game was obviously effective for the Giants, but those key sequences when you need a little bit of time. And I mean, listen, we've said this chapter and verse, right? It's like, it's almost like opposition just says like, ah, you're, you're playing okay, you're playing okay. Oh, big moment. We'll go, this is when we're going to go ahead and dial it up and make it really hard for you to be able to execute. Um, the, the other quick thing that I'll also mention, because I agree with you, when it comes to the Hubbard, it's funny. A game like this is, as you say, on a, on a game level, you go, ah, the coaching, are, are, we, are we doing the right things here? Are we getting guys in the right spots? The penalties, undisciplined play, that's absolutely brutal. Then on the high level, it's like you rewind all the way back to the offseason. And you say, so when you were signing Runyon Jr. and you're signing Illuminor and maybe some other teams, you know, Tyrod Taylor is not going to be available. Okay, money away from there. You know, Xavier McKinney or not, Saquon Barkley or not. All the decisions. Some things you look down and you go, oh, great rookie. We're all set at running back. But then on the offensive line, it's like you come back and you say, I don't know what other options were on the table, but this, this thing where you seem beholden to certain players because of the fact that they were drafted by you and trying to force them into something like they did with Joshua Zudu is brutal. And then going and getting a practice squad player from another roster as your backup plan. It, you said it. Contingency plans just did not seem to be a strong suit for the New York football giants. One last note here. This, then we'll talk about the coach a little bit. We said, hey, great, great job. Some decision making in this game really made a lot of sense. Some execution was bad. Okay, fine. The Deontay Banks piece of this is confounding. You come out of last week and Dan Duggan kind of resynthesized this because some people were pushing back on, well, you need to sit him down. And he's like, I'm not debating that they should have benched Deontay Banks, but they didn't bench him last week when the effort didn't seem to be there. And then the Najee Harris leap over a you know low driving tackle attempt from Deontay Banks, which often is, is thought of to be bad technique because your helmet is down. You don't see where the player is. That's what seems to have gotten him benched. And it's hard to determine whether or not that was the final straw for Brian Dable, get him off the field, get him out of this game, or that he was reacting to the fact that people had thought that Deontay Banks should have been benched because Dexter Lawrence came out and said, we addressed it in, in the locker room. It's all good. Everybody seemed to say, we're not worried about what you're saying on the outside. We've taken care of it. And then he gets benched a quarter and a half into this game. Can I, can I give a little hot take here? Oh, please. I think, and this is just pure speculation, speculation. that they activated Greg Stroman Jr. from the practice squad and they didn't know what they were going to get, but then they saw him on the field and they were like, huh, he's, he's doing okay. That allowed the Giants the ability to bench Deontay Banks because at least Greg Stroman showed that he was capable of being okay. able to defend because if he didn't look good, 
they might be trotting Deontay Banks back out there because there was literally no other option. So philosophically then, like even the week prior, you say, oh, there's nobody available. Like, okay. It, it, you know, you're not, first of all, you weren't in a competitive game, by the way, the week prior. So there's really no reason not to be able to send a message. It's actually be easier to send a uh, message course, in a game you're getting yeah. blown out. And you play whoever you want out there, whoever the case may be. Do you, so yeah, like, does that strike you bad? Does it rub you the wrong way that the Giants are only willing to quote unquote send the message when once they've seen that someone else can handle the role? Because then to, it still does offer a little bit of this caveat of like, well, if you play bad and we have another option, I mean, it's almost like this is not on Joshua Zudu. He was outmatched the week prior and he shouldn't be playing left tackle. But you're like, why'd you leave him out there? Because we didn't have Hubbard on the roster to be able to take him out and put him in there, or like we don't believe in Evan Neal, whatever the case may be, we're not going to move Illuminor, right? Like, it just seems like a it seems like a a a backwards logic of how to make sure that your team is bought in and sending the right message, right? Yeah, I mean, the better message would have been have him sit out the first series, prove a point, right? And then this is historically how teams always do this: you're not playing the first series, and if we give up a touchdown. Look at yourself in the mirror because you should be out there playing with us, right? And and it's like if you're making a mistake and you're running too hard, you're putting in a lot of effort, it doesn't seem like the coaches are going to blame you for that. So, like, uh, yeah, it 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 is completely backwards. You are absolutely right. It doesn't make sense. The sequencing of when Deontay Banks got benched, everyone's still trying to figure it out. Adam, I think you, you and others have hypothesized that it was trying to go low on Najee Harris, who leads the league in leaps over defenders. Like... <laughs> It might have been something where in practice they were like, whatever you do, don't go low on him. He will jump right, over you, right, he will hurdle you, right. and he will make big plays. They might have like drilled it into all of the defensive players. If anybody goes go low, low on Najee Harris, I swear to God. Right, right. And, and then, then he immediately goes like, low Ooh. as opposed to trying to wrap him up up top. And all of a sudden they're like, nope, that's it. Get him out of there because like we just won't tolerate it. If that's what it was. I'm actually okay with it. Like yeah, if you yeah. tell him no matter what you do, you have to tackle like this guy X way. And then you do the complete opposite. No problem with the benching. It just last question I have, where yeah. does it leave Deontay banks and the giants long-term? Because this keeps happening. And I, I said it last week. I forget someone. I forgot to who gave the credit, but it's like Deontay banks. Isn't the guy that he thinks he is at the moment. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it's like, what does that mean for Deontay banks long-term with the giants? Yeah, it's funny because we're talking about some draft picks that look really good early in the season, you know, through the course of this season, young guys, and that's really great. I think right now I would just say, and I'm not, I don't, I don't want to overstate it, but in this moment you would say it leaves Deontay Banks further from a second contract with the Giants than closer, right? Because my my thinking would be you're going to go into next year's offseason, you're going to have money, the draft, maybe you go and sign what you believe has already been a proven number one cornerback, and then Banks is playing number two, right? Okay, and he can look better in that role and the results can be better. But as it stands right now, this is the, the 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 graph is trending towards, oh, bad pick or mistake, or this player is not quite what we thought he was going to be versus a player that has been building on what we thought was a decent rookie season. Guess what, man? We told the stats coming into this game. It was not pretty. It's been bad. And I just wonder, as you say, is it the bravado or the confidence that you want players to have that Deontay Banks is like drinking his own Kool-Aid right now, even though he's getting plenty of information that says, hey, you need to work harder, improve. Uh, we'll find out. And um, unfortunately, that's something that I think has going to have to be TBD, but it'll be interesting to watch over the remainder of this season. And we'll continue to cover this team, no matter which direction they're headed. They have Washington, a division game coming up here. We'll see how that result pans out. We'll talk about injuries as we move through the week. We'll also talk about key matchups, some betting lines as well. And then what is the chatter, if any, around potential trades for the Giants ahead of the deadline? Until next time, though, you get over on YouTube and you get over on the podcast feed and you go and you check out one of our sponsors, Personum. That's an AI-driven threat detection system that you can use for your business. Go to personum.ai today to learn more. But in the meantime, until the next time, until the best times, as Andrew Mackowitz would want, need, and nay, demand that people know. As always, let's go big blue.